Hi, dear friends, some words of Torah for Sukkot. We're just beginning the holiday, but let me take your minds to a prayer that we say upon leaving the Sukkah at the end of the Chag. There's a prayer that we say, a one-liner, Yehi Ratzon, Keshem Shekiyamti V'yashavti B'Sukkah Zu, May it be your will, O Lord, that in the same way that I have fulfilled the commandment and dwelt in the Sukkah, Kain Ezkeh L'Shana Haba'ah, so may I merit next year to dwell in the sukkah made from the skin of the Leviathan. This very cryptic statement is based on the Gemara and Midrash, which discuss a creature called the Leviathan, the Leviathan. According to tradition, this is the same sea creature known as Taninim, the giant sea creatures from Genesis chapter 1, which were created on the fifth day together with all other aquatic life. Rash he cites the Talmud that originally Hashem created two Taninim, two great sea serpents, but then had to kill one of them lest they overpopulate the oceans and destroy the ecosystem. There is therefore one Leviathan left alive, and as recorded in Tehillim, Hashem in some way plays with this Leviathan on a regular basis. Leviathan ze yatsarta bo. Additionally, the Talmud states that the Leviathan's meat will be used for, the, for a festive meal for the righteous in the world to come, and that at that time Hashem will fashion a sukkah for the righteous made out of the skin of the Leviathan. What in the world does this all mean? We'll get back to this, but let's recall Yom Kippur for a moment. The Haftarah at Mincha was the book of Yonah. There's an interesting connection between Yonah and Sukkot. For one thing, the verse states that Yonah made a sukkah for himself after fulfilling his dispatch from God to exhort the people of Nineveh to repent. In chapter 4, it says that Yonah sat at the outskirts of the city, vayas lo sham sukkah, and he fashioned for himself a sukkah. Now, of course, one might argue that a sukkah is any hut meant to protect someone from shade. But there's something strange in the way that Hashem reacted to Jonah's sukkah. We would have thought that a sukkah would have provided ample shade for Yonah from the heat and the sun. We need to understand why, in the very next verse, Hashem prepared something called a kikayon, a large leafy plant, to grow over Yonah and provide him shade. Also strange is why was Yonah much happier with the kikayon as a source of shade than his own sukkah, as recorded in the verse. Perhaps there's something more to Yonah's sukkah than meets the eye. Today, there is a mosque in modern-day Mosul, Iraq, which originally was the city of Nineveh. The name of the mosque is Yunus and contains a large courtyard which purports to be the burial site of the prophet Jonah. Based on this verse, it was documented by a sociologist in 1932 that Iraqi Kurdish Jews visit the grave site of the prophet Yonah on Sukkot, based uh, on the verse that we just quoted that Yonah built a sukkah, because of his building a sukkah outside of Ninveh. Now, another connection between Yonah and Sukkot is a statement made by the Jerusalem Talmud that Yonah first achieved prophecy on Sukkot. He made his standard pilgrimage to the temple in Jerusalem, and when he experienced the Simchat Beit HaShoeva in the temple, the great celebration over Chol HaMoed Sukkot, he was filled with such joy that he was immediately filled with the prophetic spirit. The Talmud says that we see from here that only when a person is happy can he or she achieve prophecy. This is also witnessed, says the Talmud, by the prophet Elisha, who, when needing to prophesy, summoned a minstrel to play pleasant music so that he could enter into a joyous mood. When reading this Gemara, I was struck by how incredible the Simchat Beit HaShoeva must have been in the temple. As inspirational as it no doubt was, I don't think that I could have ever achieved prophecy amidst the celebration. My mind tends to wander and gets distracted when I'm in a large crowd of people, and it's hard for me to focus. They say that there are different kinds of personalities. Introverts tend to find strength and inspiration when in small groups or in solitude, whereas extroverts thrive off of the energy and excitement of large crowds and the stimulus this provides to their creativity. Very few people are exclusive introverts or extroverts, but I think there's a reason why the Gemara gives two examples of how one achieves the happiness necessary for prophecy. For Yonah, it was being part of his people and seeing all of the togetherness and spiritual excitement. 
For Elisha, a quiet moment with inspirational music was his means of achieving spiritual greatness. Two great men achieved happiness, one in the midst of a throng of people, the other in solitude. There's a duality contained within the holiday of Sukkot that is a carryover from Yom Kippur. We prayed and did tshuva together as a community, but it was also necessary for each individual to express his or her own unique tshuva effort as a solitary being standing before God. On Sukkot, we create structures that have solid walls but allow for a glimpse of the sky above. This represents a vertical connection to God, even when we are segregated horizontally in our own private Sukkot from the rest of Am Yisrael. At the same time, we take the four species, representing all the different kinds of Jews, and bind them together so that we may make an Aguda Echat, a united and unitary nation that we so yearn and pray for over the high holidays. When we consider the kind of extroverted person Yonah was, and how connected he felt to his kinsmen, we can certainly understand why he did not want to do God's bidding and tell the people of Nineveh to repent. Our sages teach that he was concerned that this non-Jewish nation's repentance would make his fellow Jews look bad, and so he fled from his mission out of a great concern and regard for the Jewish people. Hashem needed to teach Yonah that it is equally important to follow God as it is to unite with the Jewish people. He therefore thrust Yonah into the belly of a fish, forcing him to relate to God in solitude instead of amidst the throngs in the temple courtyard. Going through that experience, being completely isolated under the ocean, away from everyone else, taught Yonah how to find the introvert within himself and realize his relationship with Hashem as an individual. When he left the fish and performed God's bidding, Yona built himself a sukkah to remind himself of the isolated fish experience, since that is what the sukkah represents, that vertical relationship to God separate from the rest of one's people. Hashem prepared the kikayon plant and placed it over his head, separating him from the sky above, to remind Yona that he should also embrace the extroverted part of his personality that takes joy in being of this world and the people in it. This is why Yonah rejoiced when receiving the Kikayon, realizing that God was not forcing him to sublimate his natural tendencies. We now return to the Leviathan. Just like Yonah's fish, the solitary Leviathan that Hashem keeps alive is like the classic introvert among the Jewish people. He's a loner and wishes only to frolic with God himself. In the future world, Hashem will show the introverts that they must dispose of their solitude. Hashem will take the deceased Leviathan and make a sukkah out of it, a sukkah that will be so large that it will contain all the righteous. No longer will the loner spirit of Leviathan dwell within man's psyche. Mankind will realize that we are really all one and that divisions between people are illusions. The sages teach that in the future world, the person who will bring the Leviathan to the great festive meal for the righteous will be none other than Jonah. He will demonstrate that just as he found spiritual greatness among his people, being the antithesis of the loner Leviathan, so will all mankind, introverts included, be able to do the same. We will consume the Leviathan as a way of putting our solitude and loneliness behind us. Being part of a Jewish community can be the most joyous of experiences and can also be one of the most annoying of experiences, and I'm sure we've all experienced both sides. But our goal should be to realize that we are really all one, all part of the unitary God who created us from himself. We are all headed towards greater unification and of eliminating the Leviathan within ourselves. And so, dear friends, may we all experience the joyful solitude of the sukkah, together with the joyful coming together with our four species, our Lulav, Esrog, Hadas, and Arava. And may we greet Mashiach together at the Su'uda for the Leviathan. May we see it bimhei rabbi, amenu, amen. Here's wishing you a Shabbat Shalom and a Chag Sameach, a joyous Sukkot holiday, dear friends.